I didn't say it should be a tax law or anything, but it was fun. I like to move the box. It's pretty good about this one. Hi right, guys, if I can give everybody's attention, I don't think we need a mic tonight. Thank you for coming, taking time out on this busy, I don't know, rainy, icy day out there. Um, and uh, hopefully it's worth your while. The goal of Cryptocurrency 2.0 is to create a network of people that have something in common, right? So if any of you guys ever called me or emailed me asking me about a coin or how to do this or that, I would answer. It's to create a network where we can help each other. Uh, and mutually beneficial, right? You learn something from me, I learn something from you guys all the time. I'm never the smartest guy in the room. And uh, a lot of people in here know that. Um, and I'll let you introduce Raj, that allowed us to use this place and uh, talk about his company. Thanks, Abdul. So uh, my name is Raj Sharma, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, HealthBiz. Uh, we share this space with other people and I'm happy to host you guys today. And I'm just going to, I don't have a formal slideshow like uh, Bill did, Mr. Formality here, but uh, I'll just uh, share a little bit about what we do and then um, also um, uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit about um, the Mindshare space and, uh, you know, we, we are lucky that the, the person who owns this has offered this space uh, to not only people who are part of Mindshare, but also to host meetups like this. So, I know some of you had some problems getting in. I apologize for that. We'll do a better job next time having a sign outside or yeah. something. <laughs> but, um, so Health is, is, um, is a startup. We are, uh, we are at the juncture of healthcare and blockchain, right? And we are solving two biggest problems in healthcare that exist today. A lot of people tell us that's the holy grail. If you do it, you'll be a trillionaire, whatever, right? But the, the two problems that we are solving are our medical records are aggregated all, are, are scattered all over the place, right? So some of them are with doctors, hospitals, genetic uh, lab reports, and um, we have a mobile platform that essentially helps people aggregate their medical records from different sources on their phone. The second big problem, that, and that's a big problem, you know, if, if Google tried it, failed, uh, Apple has finally come out with something which is very, very similar to what we're doing, which is great. So now we have a big gorilla helping you know, move the market forward. The second problem is um, interoperability. And now there are some standards that are coming out so you can take medical records from one place and make it, and make some sense out of it if you share it with somebody else. So that's what we are focused on. So the standards are on fire. And then, you know, the question is, well, what are you doing with blockchain, right? So um, we see it as a three-step process. Number one, aggregate your medical records on your phone. Two, standardize it, normalize it so that you can share it. And finally, share it using blockchain, and then get rewarded for it. So we are going to issue our own token coin, our own coin, and uh, we're in the process of. We thought we were going to do an ICO, but we have essentially delayed it indefinitely because of all the regulatory issues. We are still going to mint our coins. We are still going to issue our coins. People will still be able to buy it. We are just not going to market it as an investment. There are no dividends. We are not going to use that money to. You know, develop our platform further. Our platform, when we come out in April, is going to be fully functional, and people will be able to buy those tokens, use it in the app. So that, so our intention is not to advertise it as an investment, and our intention is to help people buy it because they can use it in the app. That's, that's the point. So that's that's how we are sort of progressing with the ICO. You know, we know that it's not going to we're not going to sell all our coins in one hour. Uh, it might take a long time. That's okay. But we still want to be clear of the SEC regulations. So, um, so that's about uh, HealthBiz. Um, Anna is here with uh, with us as well. Anna Robertson, she's our she heads up our marketing. Uh, we have a team of about five or six people here. Kevin is there, working away. He's doing some really interesting stuff with uh, um, using state chains on uh, on Ethereum network to prove provenance of medical records when, when, you know, to, to prove the, um, the, the root and provenance of medical records. So he's doing some work <coughs> there using state channels, which is very interesting. And uh, then you have people in China, you have people in Boston, you have people in uh, India who are developing some of the back-end stuff. And uh, we have a beta version out, and then we're going to have uh, uh, full, uh, the next version out in April time. All right, thank you, Raj. Yep. We're excited.
All right, guys. How many people were here at the first presentation? Raise your hands. It's going to be very interactive. I like to keep my presentations more of a conversation than a lecture, like class. First time, I think that was the first time Bitcoin crossed 10,000 was the night of the first presentation. <laughs> what is it at now? 8,500? 8,200? It's been a wild ride, huh? Touched 19, went back to 57, and then back up. I mean, at least it's volatile. You have the opportunity to make money or lose a lot of money. So today we're going to go deeper into, I've already done two on introduction. There was one in Reston, one in DC. This is going to be deeper into mining. And feel free to interrupt me anytime if you guys have any questions. And uh, we'll start with the root of mining. Or why do we mine and what does it mean? All right, mining. Let's take a look. What is Bitcoin mining? Mining is when transactions are verified and become available to the public ledger, aka the blockchain. Anyone can be a miner as long as you have the appropriate hardware, stable internet connection, um, and of course electricity, you're ready to start. So it's a proof, right? So what is blockchain? And uh, last, I don't know if anybody listened to the Senate's hearing yesterday with uh, the, F uh, the SEC. They're talking about blockchain wouldn't exist without Bitcoin. And that is true, right? The main purpose right now or the most use of, of blockchain technology is through Bitcoin. Um, and it's one of the first ones. It gets registered, it's a transaction, it can never be duplicated. Um, somebody steals it from you, it'll always be original, and anybody can look at it, right? The ledger keeps going. What is Bitcoin at right now? Anybody know? 17 million or 16 mine? And we're going up to 23 million? 21, yep. I think. 21. And then, I don't know, there's rumors there's a lot hidden and this and that too, so uh, we'll go into that. And then there's two types of Proofs. The first one is proof of work, right? So Bitcoin, the godfather of every coin, works on proof of work. Proof of work is defined as an economic measure to deter denial of service attacks and other services by networks. And usually the process time of a computer. Proof of work is not a new concept. Um, it's used for Bitcoin. So proof of work is I have a machine, it's mining, and when it hits a Bitcoin, everybody knows about it and it can't be done again. It's almost like an algorithm, right? And then I have a live miner here too, we'll review that in detail and we'll go over that too. Um, simply put in terms, the means calculations are required to the network nodes in order to have a distributed ledger. The process is called mining. A distributed ledger is a decentralized system that can agree on and keep track of correct amounts in a wallet providing a history of every single transaction. So if anybody wanted to ever go through the 17 million transaction of Bitcoins, they can. Right? If you try to hit that number at the right machine, it won't work. It won't get added to the blockchain. And that's proof of work. Bitcoin is proof of work. Litecoin is proof of work. Bitcoin Cash is proof of work. And Ethereum, of course, is proof of work too. That's the GPU mining. So, I mean, you have two types of mining. Bitcoin, Litecoin, they all mine through ASIC. Uh, it's a manufacturer called Bitmain in China. They moved their whole headquarters to Switzerland because of China's current regulations um, and scrutiny. So, and then I think they're having a headquarters in uh, Canada as well. Uh, one of the guys was talking about it. And then we'll go over the ne next type of proof. So this is centralized, one main going out, decentralized, you have main and then issuing out and distributed. Everybody knows, right? All right, let's talk about the purpose of mining. What is the purpose of mining? Um, conventionally, mining has always been related to looking for gold or diamonds. I mean, the concept remains the same, right? But it's more technical and mathematical. It's a mathematical algorithm that the computer looks for the next one in the chain. So mining process is which proof of work is generated. Before we can get into exact purpose of mining, we need to address what is block. Block is a permanent storage of records that includes a group of data of all or some of the transactions that have not yet been included in the previous blocks. The main purpose of mining is to verify the legitimacy of a transaction and prove that it's not a double spend. A double spend is when the same coin are spent more than once. Since mining is a strenuous process, miners are rewarded for their work upon successful completion of a mining block. Rewards vary by coin and can change over time. Explaining like I'm five here, this is what happens. The transaction is made, included with other transactions on the block. 
miners verify the block are legitimate, in order they must solve a mathematical problem. So what does this thing do? So this is the ASIC miner, guys. <clears throat> and I'll place it right here. A couple of things are required to make this operat operatable. Okay, the main component of this that only one company really does that has the best uh, ROI is called Bitmain. And they have their own pools, they have their own ant miners, and uh, they're the more, most dominant company on the face of this world, and nobody can compete yet. I, uh, we wrote an article on Samsung trying to create the chips and get into the mining. I mean, that seems exciting, right? Samsung is a huge company, has a lot of money, resources, and maybe they can come up with it, or maybe they can. Um, and this is the miner, this is the power supply, and the chip is right here, and it has three graphic cards. And its goal is to constantly review the algorithm and solve the mathematical equation to the next Bitcoin. You're usually part of a larger pool of, I don't know, millions of miners, and the goal is to keep it even. One person hits it, he splits it with the entire group. So you have an average per pool. So even if you hit it, you're not gonna make eight or 9,000 or whatever the Bitcoin price is that day. You split it with everybody, so everybody has an even amount. Um, I've heard if you get on the largest scale of 100 or 200 miners, the next level up is you're not mining, you're mining alone, so you're creating, mining your own block. But you can't do that unless you have 100, 200 miners. Um, who knows the number one miner in America? Yep. That's the guy, John McAfee, that introduced security. He's a hard believer in uh, Bitcoin, very active. Um, you guys should follow him. Most of his stuff is pretty real, um, but he has his ways though, right? He's very brutal about it. Um, <laughs> and then we'll go into further details of this. Um, you need two things, right? Two or three things. A, you need internet, of course. Not a whole lot, just regular internet. Um, second, you gotta have Electricity. Um, electricity is high. Um, one third of the world can't even mine because they don't have a steady source of electricity. So say a kid in India or Pakistan or one of the third world countries, Africa, he can't even mine because he doesn't get electricity 24-7. It's going to be not profitable for him because he can't run the machine half the time, which is a very big problem for one third of the world. Um, second thing is cooling. It needs to be in 60 degrees or less and it gives off a lot of heat. So the process, I'll go over this in detail. I have this flow, chart flow going too. We'll go over it in detail. So that's what mining is. Legitimate transactions are stored, mined on blockchain due to the competition proof of work. It can become an expensive process. What's the expensive process? Cost of the miner itself. So if you guys look on Amazon or eBay, this thing goes for at least $6,000, give or take, how the market's doing. It fluctuates 20%, just like Bitcoin does. Um, the manufacturer sells it for a fraction of the cost, but not a lot of people know how to get it. And usually they have a three to four month delay from the day you order it to the day you receive it. So at least, at least half the price if you get it in a case. Absolutely. But you got to catch it at the right time. It's not on sale all the time. They have batch releases. Yeah, March, late March. And then uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the other proof. All right, proof of stake. So this is the second type of proof. So a lot of um, smaller coins, um, even ICOs are proof of stake. Is Ripple proof of stake, isn't it? Because, huh? I'm not sure, I think it's pre-mined. It's pre-mined? Yeah. Okay. So proof of stake is an alternative to proof of work aims to achieve distributed consensus. The idea was first discussed on Bitcoin Talk in 2011 and first viewed with PeerCoin. There are many different alternative solutions to itself, so we'll talk about the basic POS. Instead of having miners prove each and every transaction is legitimate, proof of stake requires that a person hold or lock up coins and validate ownership. There are different ways. The new block creator are selected to avoid centralization or main uh, or more than 51% ownership taking control. We'll talk about this next. So Bitcoin is all about decentralization. So let me give you guys an example, a real life example. So a new coin had a hard fork the other day off of Bitcoin. Um, called uh, Psycoin. So they had their hard fork. I don't know how, but Bitmain started saying we're gonna produce their miners. So they started producing them. The limit per account was one miner. Because what they didn't wanna happen was have one of the big sharks buy 
5,000 of them, if they're coming out with 10,000, one, one company buys 5,000 of them, and then they dominate the market, right? They can manipulate the prices. So that's how decentralization even today is happening by large manufacturers, and it makes sense. You don't want one company to be a stronghold on any point. It needs to be peer and peer. Yes, sir. So, uh, how does limiting miners per account matter? Is there a cost? Because you don't want accounts? No, because you can't per email. You can't order more than one. It says limited to one per person. Oh, okay. So one company can't go in and order okay. three thousand and dominate the market. Right. So that's what yes, their goal was to keep it as decentralized as possible. And even in proof of stake, that's the same thing they try to do in that as well. Need a name of the coin. I think Dash is one of the largest proof of stake um, coins. Dash. Dash? Yeah. No, Dash has Dash miners. Asic makes them. Yeah. They're very unprofitable, FYI, but <laughs> they're made. Um, they are. Uh, they, I think they make like three dollars a day or something. <laughs> I, Dash has its miners. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Some of them do. I think any big coin usually has its own. Okay, so some type of proof of stakes, randomized block selection, coin age selection. Um, the difference from proof of work. Proof of stake is more efficient. Electricity and hardware is not needed. So that's there. Uh, more people are encouraged to run uh, nods due to efficiency. Proof of stake is not ideal for distributed consensus protocol. And um, those are different types of proof of stakes that we have. Um, that you guys can read in detail. If anybody wants a copy of this, feel free to shoot me an email. All right, let's review this. Proof of work. Proof of work is required to define an expensive computer calculation, also called mining. So that's where the calculation of ma the mathematic algorithm is. A reward is given to the miners that solves the problem. Maybe you have a machine, you've invested your time, your energy, your money, your electricity. So you, you, they reward you for that. Network miners compete to be the first to find a solution for the mathematical problem. So the machine is just mining. Um, proof of stake. Proof of stake. The creator of new blocks is chosen in a deterministic way depending on its wealth and defined as stake. So I think it's a pre-calculated amount of coins that you're going to have and you do an ICO and then you finally go live. And that's all that there will ever be. There is no mining. They're there. They're accounted for. And the owner takes responsibility for um, you know, not giving, selling 50% of his coin to one party. A POS system is there to block rewards so the miners uh, take the transaction fees. Proof of stake uh, currency can be <clears throat> several thousands times more cost effective because you're not mining. There's no investing in machines, electricity, hardware, etc., etc. Any questions, guys? Yes, sir. So essentially, you just got machines are doing the mining. Absolutely. No human interaction, so... Somewhat. I mean, managing the operation is human human interaction, right? But you can script that up easily. Sometimes you got to do manual reboot. Sometimes your network comes off the network. Sometimes if that pool gets slow, you can switch it up. So there is managing, right? Uh, and then physical managing too. If the area gets too hot, the machine will automatically stop. So it has a feature, I think, above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It just shuts off. And then you got to manually reboot it and restart it and make sure the temperature is low. It does that so the chips don't fry. I think above 80 or not. Because inside, um, you'll get, I'll show you a screenshot of a miner status. You have two degrees. You have the, out, the temperature of the outside, and then you have the temperature that the chip runs on. Chip's always running 30 or 40 degrees higher than what the outside regular temperature is. So if the outside is 65, it's running at like 90, 95. Five or 10 degrees more, it's going to fry. So I mean, the feature, the cool thing they put on here is that it just shuts off. So there is somewhat managing. Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> so um, a mining rig like that, it has to be. Uh, you can't operate in like room temperature like this. I mean, it's got to be. No, like, it's going to heat it up. You got to have a ventilation system that takes. So this side is the cool air. This is the hot air. So you see how I have aluminum there? Yeah. This is one of the ones I have to send back to Bitmain. Bitmain, there's something wrong with it, but. Um, you gotta take this hot air out of the room that it's exists in or it'll make it into 100 degrees. I think the CFM accurately is about 100 to 125. CFM, I think it's, uh, that term is used to calculate heat coming out of like one spot. Okay, so you need an additional piece of equipment to basically. Additional, like a, vent, like a ventilation system. If you yeah. put one in your entire basement, 
is it going to heat it up? Depending on how big it is, you can like put a ventilation into the other room or run it upstairs and they're yeah. fine. But can you do 20? No, not really. You'll then need a real system that you have implemented where it has an inline fan. So the way I have mine set up is um, I have like 15, 20 machines on these shoe racks. I have each one of them has a duct. I'll show you guys a picture of it too. Coming out from here, going into a big box that I have an inline fan in that takes the heat outside. The goal is the heat cannot stay inside the same room where you're gonna fry your machines. But, uh, yes. Can you legally, can you legally run it at home because it's Absolutely. a business use? Um, so there's a lawyer that comes to our meetups. I don't see her tonight. I asked her. Currently, there is no regulation. Um, you're paying for the electricity. You're paying for the internet. Um, you go on the commercial side. I have a friend that has a 300 minor ring, and he has a co-locating facility too. Um, it's cheaper. Electricity is cheaper on the commercial side, but there's no regulation right now. What's the uh, return on investment? Uh, I mean, how long? It varies. Um, varies per state, per county, what your kilowatt rate is. Like, there's going to be a big difference. I think Pennsylvania has a rate of six cents a kilowatt, which is fairly low. I think DC has one that's 15. So it comes down to numbers. And then we have consulting services. If you ever wanted to like start a rig or something, we can discuss it. Absolutely. Any other questions, guys? Close to eating. Yeah. If you go to industrial stuff, commercial, you go down to two and a half to three cents. No, that's amazing. Yeah. So that's, so that's very low, right? So that you're touching like a good profit. So what kind of profit could you make? I mean, if you you're putting up six thousand up front for a um, machine like that. Give or take on so Bitcoin manipulates a lot, right? So at, when Bitcoin's at eight thousand, your mining per day cut's going to be a lot smaller when Bitcoin's at nineteen thousand. Sure. So that varies too. But give it anywhere from twelve to up to thirty. If Bitcoin hits nineteen thousand, a decent machine that's running good should give you twenty five thirty dollars. But twenty five thirty dollars a day okay. per day every day. Nonstop. And that's net after no that's gross gross you've got to minus your cost of investment facility right. electricity cooling so that's just a gross number everybody's expenses can be different right xyz those are details that you can get into but okay. that's the gross amount Maybe but i had, I had yeah. done some calculation back in december a couple months ago uh -huh. and uh, looking at the numbers again i've not practically run yeah. But uh, my calculation was that one of these could generate up to uh, 0.9 to 1 Bitcoin in a year. In a year. Was, is so that something you're seeing? Eight, so do 8,000 times 12. I mean, the again, 12 the dollar value, value I did not yeah. get. Or 10, let's like, take an easy number like 10, so grand. grand. <laughs> I mean, you're that's about right. That's you're about, right. Yeah, that's about right the same there. as what you said. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the same. Yeah. So, um, so it's close. Small part yeah. Uh, I mean, under to be honest with you guys, under ten is a hobby, right? Yeah. That's what me, and me and another buddy. Anything under ten is a hobby. The true money that you're ever gonna make mining is if you go into larger numbers, 15, 20, 30 miners. That's where you can truly exit your full time thing. Because less than ten won't pay you enough to hopefully quit anything in Northern Virginia, right? I mean, it's expensive to live out here. Let's face it. Um, under ten is a hobby. Above ten, you start getting a little bit more serious. 20, 30. I have a friend that's been doing. 30 Litecoin miners for about a year. Um, and he used to do it when like, and he held on to a lot of Litecoin. And he's doing very well now. But is he doing very well by virtue of the appreciation? Of both, the both. Okay. He's, I mean, you should run 30 for a year and see where Litecoin was a year ago and where it is now. Even if you just held 25% of what you mined or 10%, that's more than enough. And uh, the opportunity is there, and then I was surprised how the Senate. Oh, go ahead. So, is, when you is there a, an efficiency to mining one versus the other, and does the same machine mine multiple coins? No. So you have different machines for different miners. So we'll go over that. Let's move on. Um, I go over each machine, the most popular ones at least. Okay. So this is what I was talking about, right? So this is the machine. This is the heat coming out. The ventilation you need right here to take the heat out of the room. Um, you need to cool something cooling, at least 70, 60 degree air coming in right here. You have a power supply, so as, this is the power supply, the separate power supply that connects to the miner. Um, you have the router connected, so on this side, if you see it, that's where you connect the ethernet. And then the other thing is these things run on 220 only. 
So electricity is very high. Um, runs on 220. This does 1300 watts. Um, and uh, it won't work well on 110. Any questions, guys? So this is just the airflow that I drew. Okay, this particular machine, there are a bunch of power supplies that you can get. Um, yeah, some absolutely. Some for 110, some for 220. Uh, but I've always heard on 110 it doesn't work well. It doesn't work well. Yeah, it's like you're going to lose the hashing power. You, you, you have companies, there are companies claiming that they are better than Pitman power supply, but uh, after all the analysis that I have done, just go to Bitmain. When you're buying the miner, just buy the power supply with them. Yeah. That is best compatible. Even for, uh, they have two or three versions of it. I think there's a plus and there's a plus plus. But just take the one which has the 220, I think is the plus plus. And don't even look at the other power supplies. It's not worth it. They won't perform the way this one. Oh, and another thing is you're probably gonna have to, if anybody just decides to do it at home, the wiring needs to be upgraded to like a 10, 12 gauge wire. And your breaker has to be upgraded 30 amps. And you have to hire an electrician to set everything up. Because <laughs> most people don't have 220 outlets lying around at home that are going to get 1300 watts. Usually they're reserved, reserved for like dish, uh, like I don't know, uh, what do you call it? Washing machines and heaters and. Oh, so this is a minor status, right? How do you know your minor is working? Alive, alive. As long as one of them is alive, and this is the number. So you have three cords running, and this is your frequency. And this is your hash rate. And it should equal, they all should be, should have numbers on there. And you know, and that mostly when, usually if it's offline, it'll say all of them are dead, and you'll see no numbers, no hash power being generated. So this is your software side of things. So there's two types of reboots you can do on these two machines. One is called a software reboot. You go to minor status, and you can reboot it. Um, software wise, if that doesn't solve your problem, you gotta manually unplug it. And the last and third step is you do a reset. So there's a way to reset these things. You start it, let it run for five seconds, get a pen or something sharp and stick it in there and hold it for five seconds. It'll go back to resetting to uh, its original settings and reboot. Um, those are the three like troubleshooting things. I've done something more too. I've taken this whole thing apart taken out the card and plugged it back in. Um, I got these instructions from a Bitmain tech guy. I said, I'll give it a shot. I did it, it worked. So it's just another computer. That's all there is. This is a fan, it's a card, it slips in, you unscrew everything. Um, pretty simple machine. You were able to get to a Bitmain um, support? Yeah, they're pretty good. They yeah. reply within 24 hours now. Really? Yeah, That's and then they, they send you a survey too now. Hmm. I think this had English as good. Yeah, 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 it was good for me. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Because I, mean, I heard some feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning, but I think they've expanded a lot. So I think Switzerland, Canada. So I think they're really taking over because they really don't have no competition. Yeah, exactly. Even McAfee and these big guys, they all use ASIC machines. The ROI is the best on an ASIC machine. Even the Ethereum GPU mining. If you really, I ran the numbers a few times, and these are more profitable. The ROI is much better on this than even the Ethereum GPU or whatever you're deciding to All right, so this is the S9. That's the machine right in front of you guys. Hash rate 11.5, 12.5. They advertise it as 13.5 Tera hashes, and I've hit that hash rate. That's just your hashing power, how much it hashes. Um, power consumption, I, you gotta take the 1300. I mean, if it's gonna do 1300. Um, that's the power efficiency, the voltage, and then I guess the dimensions. Um, it makes noise, it's pretty loud. Um, I don't think we have a 220 outlet anywhere here that we can plug in. So it makes a little bit of noise and uh, heat does come out. Uh, we'll go and review the top couple. So L3s, I really like these machines, right? Um, I have a hard buddy of mine, hardcore L3. He won't mind anything else except Litecoin. A um, couple of reasons. This runs on 700 to 800 watts, almost half the cost of a Bitcoin miner. Um, it's just a, it's a smoother running machine in my experience. Um, runs lower. You can put more in one facility and use less electricity. Um, usually their cash value is pretty much almost the same. Bitcoin may be higher a little bit, maybe 10 to 15 percent, but not much. Um, and they're solid machines, same thing, under 60, under, under 70 degrees, 
Um, ventilation system, 220. Alright, this is the brand new miner. Um, I have one running at home. It's about half the size, a little taller. It mines something new called a side point. Um, it runs on, I think, 1300 watts, same as an S9. And uh, it mines one of the newer coins. Is Still he, has three boards, 180 chips. Go on. Is the advantage in grinding some of these newer coins because presumably they're less valuable? Yeah, um, absolutely. Is, is the idea that there's so less this competition? Is, so this is what happened, right? Beginning, first two days, I think the delivery whoever got from Bitmain, it was mining $330 a day. After two days, more people got it dipped to $125 a day. And then after about a week or so, it went down to $60, $70. So this miner was selling for ten to twelve thousand on eBay the first day or two it was released because everybody was losing their shit. Everybody's saying it's mining three hundred thirty dollars a day, and for two days it did. But you can't promise that it's going to do that for very long. But people did sell and buy machines these at like twelve thousand, ten thousand, because people were hoping that it'd do three hundred for like another week or two. I don't know. I haven't done research on it yet, but I think it's going to be a whole lot, though. Yeah. Any question, guys? Yeah, I'd like to do with one action. Yeah. That really isn't about necessarily finding a coin, but the exchange. Let's say we were all the owners of a variety of yeah. coins themselves because of an ICS or an ICO. There's obviously, I would imagine, perhaps a lot of some profit to be made. Are you at all or any of your colleagues focused on the actual exchange of all of us buying and selling various coins? Yeah, yeah, support? absolutely. So, I mean, every miner is an investor, right? Sure. You got to read the market. Like, if I'm mining side coin and what's been going on lately, I'm probably going to hold on to my coin, right? wait until it rises. So somewhat, you're an investor as well. So there's a lot of coins out there. Um, I think, not last night, the night before Bitcoin hit 5,700, today it's 8,200. You could have potentially made 25% or 30% in two days, right? right? And a lot of people did. A lot of old Bitcoin guys um, that have been around in the game for a while did. They went ahead and bought 10, 15 Bitcoin at 5,700, knowing that it's bound to go up. So there's always day trading going on to, um, I think uh, there's one ICO in particular that me and a couple of my buddies bought at 22 cents. It's hit 341, but we never sold. They went back to 150 and we still have it. So I mean, those if you ever get into an ICO, do your research, read the white paper, see how well, what exchanges it lands on, right? So Sidecoin, you mine it, it's on Bitrix, I believe. So you can transfer to Bitrix, sell it for Bitcoin, transfer it to Bitcoin to Coinbase and cash it out. If you really wanted to cash out every day, it is possible with any of these miners, right? Because whatever coin they mine, they're on major exchanges. Litecoin's on probably every exchange, Bitcoin's on every exchange, Sidecoin's on one of the major exchanges. So what's, what's the uptime of this guy? What, what was, what's the uptime of 24 hours? How many hours is actually worth? All the, all the time. It's just nonstop running. So what's one day, 12 hours? 24. No, it's so, so it never goes down. Never goes down. No, it, it only goes down if it's messed up, right? If it overheats. Yeah, so how uh, often does it do that? Not often if you control the temperature. Uh, mine, I don't think I've gone down in a couple of weeks. I think any of them, knock on wood. But, right, so uh, is there any stats like on the actual uptime? Because I mean, they all Yeah, so this is the, the screen that I showed before. Those are active um, statuses. So I can log into my computer from anywhere and look at the statuses. And then also you have the pool status too. I can show you guys. You guys have Wi-Fi here, Raj? Yeah. Yeah. I, let's, let me show you guys something. So, so every pool that you have usually has its um, own uh, URL that you can log into. So thank you.
Huh? No, don't answer them. <laughs> I'm not answering them. Are they trying to connect? I, I, we'll give it some time. Right, so this is a live one, right? So this is your minor status that you can log in anytime and look at it. Um, it's usually the IP address of the minor that you have, and then you have a login for it too, like the username and password. And those are live statuses that I took screenshots of. And then there's multiple ways you can look at it. One way is log into your pool URL. The true way is to log into the IP address of the machine and truly check the minor status like this. So usually what I do is I have a computer at home that just runs at home. I have Team Viewer. I can probably log in from anywhere in the world into that PC and just be with. How do you secure your I understand yeah. you've got 10 machines versus yeah. 100 machines. Yeah. You want to have to secure one network in such a way that you know, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I don't know. I don't believe in wallets. I believe in exchanges. Um, oh, okay. Just because I'm very active in trading, I'll usually, I don't like the inconvenience of wallets. I got to move money out, move money back in. I mean, if Binance and Bitrix really go down, I mean, so, I so you, you hold all the money in exchange? Not hold, I'll cash them out too, right? So, I mean, the management of the machines has to come from the mining, right? Like, the electricity bill is not low, right? It's a couple of thousand dollars. Like, that's got to come from there. So, you do a cash out to manage the business. Right, but whatever you have in coins, you don't, you, don't, you don't have a wallet, right? No, I don't have a personal wallet. Because the idea of a wallet that you separate out your main... Yeah. We pass the from the internet. Absolutely. Like, if you want a long term keep it. Someone breaks in and always gone. Yeah. I mean long term keeps it. But so I basically mean, what you you're what you're suggesting you're doing right now is from your pool you're directly putting it yeah, in an exchange? Yeah. A pool to an exchange and then exchange to percentage of it cashed out and a percentage of it invested in other coins that I believe in, right? No, but the yield is going directly into the exchange. Yeah. And the exchange is okay with it because yeah. exchanges are not okay with Oh, no, okay they're okay with it. Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Some exchanges go to No, okay. I mean, most exchanges, I use Coinbase and they're okay with it. Yeah. So, so when you buy a miner, right, yeah. it's an L3, right? So are you actually assuming there's going to be 100% uptime, really? Yeah, that's the goal of it. If you oh, go it's to, a goal, right. But, but if you go to any data center, every server or machine is usually running all the time. I mean, mine run 24 hours a day. I never shut mine off. I know, but it just it goes over heating, blah, blah, blah. No, down, but if you, know. you maintain the temperature in the room, it has no reason to shut off, right? The goal is to run it day and night. You want it to keep hashing, right? You're not going to run this machine like, for I'm the next... I find it hard to believe that downtime is zero. I just I can't get it. I've seen the data centers. And yeah. There's no server which runs 100%. I mean, this lifeline on this is two years, right? You don't expect it to run the next 20 years. Right. The goal is in the next two to three years, there's going to be new machines, faster processors, faster chips. And the goal is to have it mine as much as possible in the next two to three years, right? You get the best out of your ROI. Right, that's, that's what the goal. I'm just thinking, like, when I'm calculating, right? Yeah. I need to put the downtime, and you're saying put zero. That's what you're saying. I, I have zero. Okay. And anybody that I know has miners <coughs> has zero. So these ASICs that will have MBBS ratings and all yeah. that, and if you really want to get scientific about yeah. it, you can. But, you know, if you're just running a mining operation, what the hell, you can run yeah. all the time. Absolutely. I don't think it's connecting to the internet, guys. Well, you can take that code. Hold on. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, you do have to have a setup. I mean, it's just. check the profitability of Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash and you can swap out to start mining Bitcoin Cash when that is more profitable versus Bitcoin. So people would do that, they would change their pool and start mining Bitcoin Cash when that is more profitable because it's all tied to difficulty and the difficulty of the network changes every I don't know, two days or 
15 days depending on what client it is. So what miners typically do is if they have a machine which can work on multiple coins, they keep an eye on which is more profitable at that point in time and swap the mining to, from one pool to another. So they would mine Bitcoin Cash for some time and then come back to Bitcoin as well. So how is it, how is mining taxed then? Is it like on like your income, your marginal income tax is going to be there or tax? Yeah. It's yeah, it's a regular income. But so I'm so not a, a, a tax expert, so <laughs> what else is there to be talking? But it's 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 your income, it's an ordinary income. So it's the same as short term profit in gains. That's my understanding. So what what you I mean it is as if you were doing anything else if you're a farmer growing stuff. You know, once you sell it's it. not letting me go in, I don't know why. You so keep it if you keep in the so bar, you don't have actually income. So the people set up LLC. Type in the Google. LLC doesn't yeah. matter. It yeah. doesn't shield. I think there might be something. Um, yeah, might so you're call. registering it. I mean, I have a friend that has it like commercially done. He's registered with the state um, as a miner. He has a commercial facility. And you pay tax on it minus your expenses, right? right. Just like we're 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 tax, right? Yeah. The tax regime. It just the corporate rates are very low, so things you don't have, want to set up a sequence. Things have, yes, things have sort of been turned on their head. Jim is actually a tax lawyer. I am a tax lawyer. Yes. Oh, that's so I mean, awesome. yeah, I think that doesn't matter what type of entity. I think that's your choice, whatever you want to incorporate so you yourself. Don't sell it for Oh yeah, FYI. Um, so U.S. Customs calls you when you order yeah. these. Um, they ask for your federal ID. Um, they did. FYI, I think I don't know if you order one if they call you, but I think I had an order of three, and they've called me a couple of times, and I've given them my company name, my name, my federal ID, social, and date of birth. So you just want to make sure. Would they ask you what what's for? I'm like, it's my name. This is my company. We mine. They're like, okay. They just want to make sure it's not drugs or anything. Or you don't have a record of drug dealing or something. I don't know what they check, but FYI. It's an AML stuff. Yeah. I don't know, I'm not able to get through to the site right now, guys. I think there's firewalls on this internet that aren't letting me in. Yeah, I see. All right, back to the basics. I know <clears throat> we're gonna, on cryptolitics.com, I wanna do another section on how to buy a currency because a lot of people are asking me about it. Um, cash to coin, Coinbase, it's the most biggest company that had a billion dollars worth of revenue on transaction fees last year. Um, best company, um, I've never had a bad issue with them. Um, you can connect your bank account, a credit card, or a debit card. Debit cards and credit cards have a lower limit per week, especially in the beginning. I think they start you off at $100. Uh, bank transfers are 10,000. You take it from there, Coinbase has four coins in there. What are they? I know there's some investors in here, huh? Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin, Cash, and Ethereum. Yep, they have four, four major currencies. It's like the President's Club. You land Coinbase, your coin is gonna stick around forever. Um, they're the four best coins. Once you have coin in there, so say if I buy Bitcoin, once I have coin there, then you can go to other, other exchanges like Binance and Bittrex and KuCoin and XYZ that only trade coin for coin. You move your Bitcoin there or whatever you bought and buy it for you know Tron, Ripple, Neo, XYZ, whatever you want. Any questions, guys? I'm gonna add a little bit to what he said. Um, although Coinbase lets you get the fiat currencies in, the transaction costs of uh, Coinbase is really high. What you wanna do is they have an exchange in the back end which is connected to the same wallet called GDAX. GDAX. Yeah. So you wanna to go to GDAX, your wallet is shared across Coinbase and GDAX. So using the same fiat currency in GDAX at zero transaction cost or very low transaction cost, you can convert your fiat currency over to any of the four premium currencies you just mentioned and buy it at a lower cost. Transferring, uh, I don't find this, uh, comes along with the SegWit addresses which we are trying right now and Lightning Network hopefully soon. I read about that recently. Yeah, yeah, they're, so it's they're a new type of SegWit is, uh, they're there's testing. a coin too, right? SegWit coin that had a hard fork too? Mm -hmm. What if it's, so SegWit 2X was another one of the yeah. Bitcoin hard forks. Yeah. There, there's a whole story behind it. Let's <laughs> not get into that. Yeah. But SegWit is a technology which helps um, 
Big question. Hey, I suppose that could be one cost. Are you looking for Bill Joe or Kirk Bill? Yes, second again, being the quick test, and that's what's going to say. But again, when you're transferring stuff from Coinbase to any other exchange or from GDAX to any other exchange, what I would recommend is convert it to Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash before transferring. Uh, it's faster, it's cheaper, and it's a lot more cost effective. And then you can convert it. It's still going to be cheaper than just transferring. All right, guys, any other questions? Feel free to reach out to us. You can register at cryptolyticsinc.com too. Um, we put out news, daily news, about, I don't know, three to five articles new on the market, on the coins. Uh, the Senate had a hearing yesterday. It was very positive. Um, we can pull that up. I don't know why the internet isn't working. So I was surprised how positive it was. Um, they were talking about how they want to work with the technology, not against it. Uh, the, uh, I think SCC had a hearing with the Senate. So that was pretty neat. Um, so the United States is, is supporting it. It's kind of anti-China. And I think that's one of the main reasons they do it too. So it was pretty neat. So the chairman said we need to work, we need crackdown on fraud, ICOs, but he was pretty positive about letting people mine, trade. There was no talks about shutting Coinbase down or any of the exchanges. And uh, he said we should uh, motivate new technology and inspire new uh, technologies to develop. So and I think that was great. Are, are there, you know, like in Rack Space where you can go and sort of get your own server, right? Yeah. Are there facilities like that, let's say in Virginia or North Carolina somewhere, where there's like a warehouse you can just buy? Yeah, stuff you can buy. Space? So there's multiple ways people are doing it. You can buy hash rate, people sell hash rate, people sell. Hosting, you can buy one of these machines and say, I don't want to deal with it. I'll pay a hundred dollars a month. Somebody can manage it for me. I don't want the headache. So there's multiple routes and people are doing it. I think there's costs in the cloud mining too, or you can invest in a project of a local mining facility. There's a lot of different ways you can do it now. So, so why would you advocate for buying actual hardware? Oh, I'm not advocating, I'm just no, telling you people. Are. Everybody requested about mining, so I'm just talking about it. I'm not advocating it. There's a difference. We don't promote anything, right? So you wouldn't recommend actually buying hardware? I mean, I wouldn't not recommend it. I do it. There's a reason I do it, right? I mean, something I do, I wouldn't not recommend it. I would definitely recommend it. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't profitable. So how many cloud providers are going to give you an AC I know, I was asking. I yeah. have no idea. Yeah. You're not going to get an AC place. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so yeah. why not? Like you know how to set it up. Why don't you buy a warehouse? Put like hundred dollars. Maybe that's the plan in the future. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the goal, right? Is buying the hardware and then selling, for example, hash rate uh, a more stable kind of business because you're you're really prone to kind of fluctuations. Yeah, and I mean I you can't I mean you gotta do that spread between hash rate and sort of You can have a spread, but I mean I think that's like on a high scale, right? If somebody's doing a hundred, two hundred miners and you have X, Y, Z hash rate, and you want to have an investment pool going for it, you can definitely do it. But you can't do it with 10 or 20 miners. You gotta have hundreds, right? Maybe John McAfee has his own pool and mines blocks and you know does all that stuff. But when you have thousands of them, it's a different story. So there are some uh, new phones now that do mining more mobile, right? Like Electronia. Yeah. Is that easy? Is it like, is it cost effective? I personally haven't looked into one of them. I know there's a lot of things going on around mining. Um, some I know, some I don't, but I don't know much about that. I know you can mine websites too, so when you go on a website, they can put on a back-end mining where more people that they get, the more kind of it mines. It doesn't mine on the same scale as the hardware, but a very limited quantity. But you're using your people's power that are visiting the site. It works something like that, right? Are there companies that, that are offering those tools to website publishers, for example? I'm not sure. You can take a look into it. I know there's something called making your site SEO ready and then making your site like mining ability. Um, you can take a look at it. So it takes about three months to get that thing, right? Yeah. Once you order it, three to four months.
where do you get your resources or where do you find what's like a good resource for you to kind of keep up on the videos? Um, I visit my site. I have just a just a number, right? I mean, I look at Bitcoin and I can tell if the market is up or down. If you look at a number maybe a few times a day, you could probably just see where the market's at. And then I read a lot. A um, couple of sites we I read and gather information on. Um, there's Slack, there's Steam, there's Reddit, there's uh, Deskcoin, there's CCN.com. There's Facebook, there's friends, there's groups, like I'm in every group that I own a coin for. So when there's something new comes out, usually the CEOs post on like Twitter. Um, I know Justin's son's always posting on Twitter, right? If any of you guys own Tron and follow him. Um, so just, you know, just being part of groups and different uh, parts. So like John McAfee's main tweet today was, I don't know, I, I knew it would be back. I'm so glad it's back. Now everybody can stop going crazy. And I don't know, he's just very blunt about it. <coughs> At least he's honest. Anything else, guys? And if anybody wants to check it out, they can come check it out, the miner. And thanks for coming, guys. Register on the website. And we'll probably do another event um, end of the month, maybe in DC or uh, Georgetown University. I don't know. We might start doing events there. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Just don't take a picture of my barcode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not anything but this part right here. Who would put a card on that? I don't want you to call Bitman and tell her my messed up. <laughs> okay.